to the house of God. Yes. Yes. Amen. Let's get into the word of the Lord here today. Second Samuel, I want you to turn back to the Old Testament and we're going to look at a story here that uh, is so relevant uh, to all of us, but certainly as we kind of alluded to last week. But Second Samuel chapter 13, I'm going to be reading more verses than I normally do, but I, I want you to catch the significance of all that's going on here. And, and I'm not even going to read it all. I will later on in the message, I will be referring back to the end of the chapter. Stand, if you would, please, in honor of the word of the Lord. And as we respect and we stand, uh, thanking God for his word. But 2 Samuel chapter uh, 13, and we're going to be looking at some young adults here, a very sad situation, uh, but let's begin our reading there. I, I didn't say it last week or last time around, but uh, and I don't want to embarrass her, but Holiday, we're glad you're here. Yes. Amen. Nick's little sister, praise God. We're so glad that she is here. God bless you, girl. Amen. 2 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 1. Let's begin our reading there. And it came to pass after this that Absalom... Now these are all the children of David, King David. But they're like uh, the same father but different mothers. And so there's halves going on here. But And it came to pass after this that Absalom the son of David had a fair sister, half-sister really, whose name was Tamar... And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick, uh, really, for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard or impossible for him to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimei, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. And he said unto him, he said unto uh, Amnon, uh, Why are you being the king's son, lean from day to day? Here's Rich Goldeisen's translation. Why are you so down in the mouth every day? Uh, will you not tell me? And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. And Jonadab said unto him, Well, here's a simple answer. Uh, lay, lay you down on your bed and make yourself sick. In other words, pretend that you are sick. And when your father, David, comes to see you, say unto him, I, I pray you, let my sister Tamar come and give me meat and dress the meat in my sight that I may see it and eat it at her hand. So Amnon lay down and made himself sick. And when the king was come to see him, Amnon said unto the king, I pray you let Tamar my sister come and make me a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat at her hand. Then David sent home to Tamar saying, go now to your brother Amnon's house and dress him meat. So Tamar went to her brother brother Amnon's house and he was laid down and she took flour kneaded it and made cakes in the site and did bake the cakes and she took a pan and poured them out before him but he refused to eat and Amnon said have all of the men uh, uh, out in other words from me I, I just want to 
say here that not only in the message that I want to preach this morning, but for all the young adults and young people, uh, this is such an important message. There are so many principles in here about dating and about love and about all of that other uh, uh, that could be mentioned. Uh, but uh, uh, latter part of verse 9, and they went out every man from him. And Amnon said, Tamar, bring the meat into my chamber, my bedroom, that I may eat of your hand. And Tamar took the cake which she had made and brought them into the chamber to Amnon, her brother. And when she had brought them unto her to eat, he took hold of her and said unto her, Come lie with me, my sister. And she answered him, No, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not you this folly. And I, whether, uh, whether shall I cause my shame to go? And as for you, you shall be one of the fools in Israel. Now therefore, please, please, I pray you, speak unto the king, for he will not withhold me from you. Howbeit he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. Isn't that a sad story? But this is not the first time, and we see it going on today all the time, don't we? So the Bible is so relevant in what it has to say. You may be seated. I want to preach this morning on Amnon had a friend. And you will see as I get into this message that uh, obviously this is a message that is relevant and that is needed, I think, in, uh, for everybody within the church. But I want to particularly hone the focus unto teenagers and to young people, young marrieds, uh, maybe those even in middle age, because well, there's a couple of reasons for that. And number one is because of the individuals in this episode, they are young people. They are young adults. And then the second thing is the reason that I want to especially focus in on this is because it does speak of a subject that is so near and dear into those age groups' lives. And what am I talking about? Friendships. Who your friends are. And uh, how do I fit in? How am I accepted? How am I viewed by those circle of friends? What kind of an influence do they have on me? And so on and so forth. And, and we see that these are very uh, important important subjects for everybody, obviously, uh, in any of our interaction uh, with other individuals in the life in which we live, whether it's shopping, business transactions, or, or whatever the case may be, but, but friendships. And so let me say, right out of the chute here this morning, I want to give a, a warning that is based upon the passage of Scripture that I have read. Watch out who your friends are. Watch out who your friends are. And that leads me to my first consideration that I want to talk about that is in this story, and that is the associations. In other words, those individuals that we associate with. Now, I'm not talking about individuals that you may know on a simple uh, top level. In other words, surface level. I'm not talking about individuals that you may just 
us know in a, a public forum or in a group setting uh, that you may know their first name but uh, but you don't spend time with them I'm not talking about casual friendships here but I'm talking about those individuals to whom uh, that all of us we may associate with on a very deep level those individuals we hang with those individuals we spend time with those individuals we do things with those individuals that we share the most intimate of our secrets and what's going on in our heart and we talk to them about it that's uh, the friends that I'm making reference to here today and so the reason that we need to be so careful as to whom we associate with on that particular level as Christians is because you see those individuals have a very profound and significant influence upon our lives. Amen. It doesn't matter whether the significance of, of that influence, whether it's positive, which is a good thing, influence, but it can also be a very negative and ungodly influence in that way. Now, when, when you begin to think about that and you begin to think about uh, the influence uh, that these individuals can have, then you begin to understand why the Bible warns us about having those types of associations. Uh, let me give you a, a scripture that is very concise and it's very short, but it is one that deals with both the positive and the negative influence that close uh, friends have upon our lives. And that is found in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 20. It says that if you walk with wise men, you shall be what? Wise. But if you're a companion or an associate, close associate, friend with fools, then what's going to happen? You'll be destroyed. So you see the, the good influence and then you see the bad influence there. Now in the first aspect that if you walk, if, if you close, and Amos said that can two walk together except they be agreed. In other words, that you agree and, and, and your friends and, and that close association. Uh, but he's not just talking about wisdom uh, in the natural sense that, uh, you know, you're going to be wise in this or that, but I believe that it's making reference a uh, wisdom in the spiritual sense. Uh, because the same writer back in chapter 1 in Proverbs, he said that the fear of the Lord is, uh, uh, is the beginning of what? Knowledge. It's the beginning of wisdom. Uh, that the fear of the Lord, that's where it all begins. That's where it's introduced. So what he's saying that if you have friends uh, that love God and that that's where you you put your plate yourself into. Then he's saying that they're going to influence you to even a greater depth in God. They're going to influence you in a, a greater relationship with God. But then on the negative side of that, if you're a companion of fools, those the fool is said in his heart, there is no God, no reverence to God, no reverence to the word of God or the will of God or anything like that. What's going to happen? They're going to encourage you in your destruction and maybe not only lose out with God, uh, but to be in a position when you die or when the Lord comes that you're not even saved. Right. Now let me give you a couple of more scriptures. This one just deals with the positive influence of your friends. And it's found in Proverbs 27 and 17. It says, and a very familiar one, it says, iron sharpens iron. And so a man sharpens his friend. 
How many knows that iron sharpens iron? Now, he doesn't use a, a whetstone, but we, we know that iron sharpens iron, doesn't it? It has an influence on. And it may even refer to like a, a smith uh, of some kind, that he uses an anvil, and he uses a hammer that's made out of iron, and he uses it to shape and to fashion and to sharpen other pieces of iron. And so once again, he's using this in a positive sense, such as sharpen. In other words, to make you wiser, kind of like we said before. You know, we, we say, boy, that's a, that's a sharp individual. That's a sharp uh, young lady. We use it in different senses, but we use it in the sense of they're, they're smart. They've got it together. And um, so what he's saying in a positive sense, uh, that if you you hang with individuals that are in right relationship with God, they're, not, they're only going to sharpen you more in your relationship with God. They're only going to sharpen your knowledge of the Word of God. They're going to make you sharper in discerning the will of God. They're going to make you sharper in discerning what it is that God wants me to do and how He wants me to live. And and so that's how, in a positive sense, he sharpens. Now, I want you to listen to this last one that the Apostle Paul gives in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33. It's in the middle of this wonderful discourse about the resurrection of Christ. But here he warns out to the church of Colossae. What does he say here? Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Amen. That's in the King James. He said, don't be deceived. And, and parents, let me tell you this. Now, don't think that your kids are going to serve God if you allow them to run with anybody in the world. Yes. It's not going to happen. Amen. And this has to start out at an early age because when they get older and you've not done it, then you've already lost control of it. Amen. Evil communications. Wicked, ungodly. He's not just thinking of communication verbally with, with the mouth, but he's talking about friendships, who you hang with. Uh, you communicate in a very intense and level and deep level. Those individuals will corrupt good morals. That's going to corrupt manners. It's talking about uh, individuals that are, that are Christians, that maybe they're of dating age, and they start dating somebody that's not even a Christian. Come on now, I'm preaching. <laughs> Amen. It's so true. Or who their friends are, Christians, Christians. Uh, they get associated with the wrong crowd. And the, then the, the, what happens is what little they had or how much they had is going to be corrupted. Uh, because in that sense, the influence comes greater from uh, the negative sense, especially with younger people and not as maybe strong in their relationship with with Almighty God. Uh, I, I could belabor this point, but have you ever noticed in the Word of God that God is so clear about the separation of light and darkness? We as Christians are children of the light. Those that are not are referred to as children of darkness in the darkness of their sin. We don't look down upon them. I don't say that in that sense. It's just the way that it is. 
And so, uh, you know, from the very beginning in creation that the Bible said on the first day that God created light. But as soon as he did that, what did he do? He separated the light from the darkness. Now, I know that's in a physical sense and in an earthly sense of creation, but it is a spiritual sense of a principle that's going to be followed from the first day of creation all of the way through to the end of time. That there's to be this separation. I didn't give it to Ken, but in, in Corinthians as well, uh, the Apostle Paul said uh, to the Christians, come out from among them and be you separate, says the Lord. Why are we to live a separated life? Why are do we to separate ourselves from them? And so we, we see that. Now, you know, we're not to live in a cave. We're not to be nice and to love and to be friends to them. That's not what the Lord's talking about. Because you see, I was just reading the other day and I, I it, it just reminded me of this very fact. That if you go to the prophecy of Ezekiel, God is sending Ezekiel to a people that he tells Ezekiel. Ezekiel, you know, in other words, God knows, but Ezekiel, you don't know. I'm sending you on a mission to them, but they're hard-headed, they're hard-hearted, and they're stiff-necked. And whether they will hear you or not, you do not know. But I'm sending you there to warn them of what is coming unless they get turned around and return back to me. But you know what's interesting in that? That even though God is sending Ezekiel on a mission for him and the word of God and the things of God, here's what he warns Ezekiel. Make sure, in chapter 2, make sure you don't become like them. So even as we are trying to win people to the Lord, it doesn't mean that we can get in there and be like them to win them, like a lot of people think, and do the activities and involve ourselves in an intimate and on an intimate level like them uh, because it's not going to happen. The influence is going to work both ways. And so when you, when you see then that the Lord is letting us know on every level, watch who your friends are. Watch who your close associates are. Uh, we notice in, in the Old Testament that there was the moral law that was for everybody and is still for everybody today. But there was also the ceremonial law that was just for Israel. And you read through there of certain things they couldn't mingle uh, certain fabrics together. They couldn't a plow with a horse and a mule. And, uh, you know, some of those things you think, what in the world? What, what, what difference? Well, not only is it practical, make good sense, but number two, it was simply laws to make Israel to know how unique they were and to keep them separated from the world. Now, it's a good thing when you associate with the right kind of crowd. But as we said, that doesn't always happen. And in our story, that's what happened with Amnon. So let's move on. Not only the association, but the advice. Your friends that you connect with and that you are very open and intimate with in the sense of what you share with them and the things that you do together with them. Let me tell you, they're going to have advice for you when you come across a situation in your life. They're going to talk to you about it. You're going to naturally talk to them about it. It's just the way that it is and advice that is given. But I want you to notice, and I tried to accentuate it 
as, as I read it today, uh, but, but I want to do it again. Let's go back there uh, in verse 2, in verse 13. And Amnon was so vexed, he felt he was, he was just lovesick over this attractive young virgin girl. I mean, he just, he was lovesick. And, um, you know, that's, that still happens today. More people probably lose out with God over what they consider love for another individual more than anything else. They, number one, feel that they're going to win them to Christ. Or number two, they feel like, you know, that's just, this is the person for me. But it says she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. In other words, he couldn't imagine him doing anything to her, even though he... It's called love here, but even though he was in somewhat lust with her. There's a difference between being in love with somebody and being in lust for somebody. Come on, church. And a lot of times what the world calls love is not love at all. It's lust. Or it's not the... Agape, supernatural, spiritual, selfless, sacrificial kind of love. It's not that kind of love. And then notice that he could not imagine him doing anything to her, even though he may have thought these things, had these thoughts in his mind, maybe he was struggling with these temptations, and, and, and she was a virgin. He couldn't imagine, number one, doing it to him, doing it to himself, and although it doesn't mention, she mentions about Israel and about God, not about God, but in, every, in reference to Israel, to God, maybe even thought of that. But then notice the contrasting conjunction in verse 3. But Amnon had a friend. In other words, even though he could not imagine him ever acting these thoughts out or acting these temptations out, yet he had a friend who gave him advice which was not based upon the moral law or was not based upon the things of God. It was based upon your own desires, your own sexual and fleshly desires and how to have those desires met. Whether you've got to lie, whether you've got to manipulate, whether you've got to take advice, advantage of. It does not matter how you do it. Uh, if you want it, then go after it with all the gusto that there is. Sound familiar? But he had a friend. And here's where I just want to pause and say, how many young people growing up in the church that you're like anyone else, and especially the age of puberty, you know, 11, 12, or thereabouts, and the hormones are turned loose. And all of these thoughts and even temptations and all of these things are going on in your mind. But you could never ever imagine acting them out. But if you get in with the wrong crowd and they make fun of your virginity and they make fun of your abstinence, whether it be of alcohol or drugs or any other incapacitating uh, pills that you can find, uh, how many young people uh, that in their own mind could never imagine losing out with God but they had a friend who gave them advice uh, in the intimacy
Pharisees and, and the closeness of discussing these things that they gave them the wrong advice and then they acted out upon it. How many individuals, young people, could never imagine losing their virginity or getting hooked on drugs or doing something and being placed in prison? How many individuals could never imagine that scenario playing out in their life? But they got associated with the wrong crowd and the advice that that crowd gave them had more influence upon them than their own feelings of holding themselves back. The own scruples, their, the, the Word of God, the Holy Spirit working in their lives. Listen, church, God's not going to make us live a certain life. And it just comes down a lot of times to common sense. And I've already referenced it, but let me, let me just talk to the parents for a little while here today. I know they're young adults, and I know that Amnon was not living with his dad, had his own house as his house. But did you notice who noticed that was something going on in his life? It wasn't his parents, but it was his close friends. It would have been far better if David would have noticed and said, Son, what's going on here? I've noticed that you've changed. You're not, you're not acting the same. What's going on here? And I, the Bible doesn't say, and I, I don't want to get in, and I don't want to make a lot of it. I don't want to be criticizing David, and, and neither do I criticize or blame every parent uh, for everything that their kids get involved in, even when they're home and they become teenagers and so on and so forth, and then decisions as they make as young adults or don't. I, I don't blame the parents. But let me say this. If you don't pay attention and become close with your children when they are young and you discuss these kind of things with them when they are young just as a need-to-know basis. Somebody asked me, he said, when, when, do you, when do you talk about the birds and the bees to your children as soon as they ask a question? Now, you don't have to get in all the detail, uh, but it's according to their age. But if you begin to talk to them about these things and be very honest with them, then you build a rapport with them. And when they have questions, they'll come to you instead of go to their friends. But if you don't build that kind of relationship, if you don't have time for them, their friends will have more than enough time for them. Amen. If you don't have anything to say to them, their friends will give them all kinds of advice. You see, if you don't do it until they're older, they're going to already know things that they've learned from school or the locker room. And they're going to be embarrassed to talk to you about it because you've waited too long. They'll endure your maybe message that you give to them, but they'll just, you know, walk away and say, oh, mom, oh, dad. As parents, you've got to be invested even before that child is born. Well, I could spend a lot of time here, but I'm simply making the point. Amnon could not imagine doing any of these things, but he had a friend that gave him the advice, and he took that advice. Now, here, here's, here's I, I won't take long with this, but here's the last point, and it's so sad. I didn't read it in the story. Not only our associations, not only the advice that they will give, but thirdly, the abandonment. You're going to see that even though you take their advice and you get in deep, dark trouble, they're going to abandon you when you need them the most. 
See, advice is easy to give, but to be there in the hour of most need, a lot of times they're going to leave you high and dry to suffer it by yourself, even though they were the ones that told you what to do. If you were to continue the story in, in uh, verse 23 of chapter 13, it tells the story that after Amnon had forced his way with this girl he said he was in love with, and uh, his, her real brother Absalom was so enraged that he, he determined in his heart from that day he was going to kill Amnon. He's going to pay for what he has done. And it was some time later that maybe a lot of people forgot about it, but it was a sheep shearing time. And Absalom comes up with this thing and he goes to his dad and he said, Dad, uh, down in a particular town we're shearing sheep and I'd like for all of my brothers and all the family, I'd like for all of us to go down there. David even questions him, well, why, why do you want him? Well, I want Amnon to come especially. And why do you want Amnon to come? And you can read about it there. Why, why, uh, then said Absalom, if not, I pray thee, let my brother, verse 26, let him come. And he pressed him. But, but he finally allowed all these uh, young people to go down to the sheep shearing. But here's what Absalom said. When we get down there, we're going to attack Amnon and we're going to kill him for what he's done to Tamar. And that's exactly what happened. Well, the story gets out that everybody was killed. And David, when he hears his story that all of his kids and, 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 and their friends, all, all of them have been killed, uh, obviously goes in the great morning. But I want you to notice uh, in verse 32 what it says. And Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother, answered and said, this is the same guy that gave Amnon the advice to have his way with this girl he was lovesick with. Let, he said, let not my lord you, David, suppose that they have slain all the young men uh, of the king's sons, for Amnon only is dead. But now notice what it says here. For by the appointment of Absalom, this hath been determined from the day that Amnon forced his sister Tamar. So from the day that it happened and David or Absalom said, I'm going to kill him for what he's done. Amnon knew of the plot to kill Amnon. But he did not tell him. Would you like people like that giving you advice? No. What kind of a twisted individual would give somebody this kind of advice and then when they hear and find out about a plot to take them out, if he's not going to tell Amnon, go to David the king. Tell David the plot of what's going on but to remain silent and let him be killed after he acted upon your advice Amnon had a friend And so why is it so important that all of us be careful of who our friendships, deep-seated friends are? Because of the advice they give, if it's not on a godly level and it's not with godly people, they're going to give you the advice that they know of that's best. But if you want advice, young people, go to Christian parents, 
Christian grandparents. Go to Christian elders, men and women in the church. Go to the pastor. Go to somebody. Have friends that's going to uh, gonna have an influence on you to have a better relationship with God instead of destroying that relationship with God. So if young people think that they can serve God and be the best they can be for God and still hang with the crowd in the world, it's not going to happen. And so parents, be very, very careful to be attuned to your child of what's going on in their life and what is the best way to help them in that situation. So I think I can say I did at the beginning and I'll say here at the end, every one of us, pastor, rich included, I need to be careful with who my friends are. Father, I thank you today. And Lord, it's a story that has been replicated, duplicated so many times down through time. And Lord, it's so sad. And we see individuals that have grown up in a, in a good church. And Lord, that served you at a younger age. But then they got with the wrong crowd and now know where to be found. Uh, now only God knows what they're involved in, what they're doing. And it all started with running with the wrong crowd. Having the wrong friends. Taking wrong advice. Instead of looking to the Word, the Holy Spirit, and godly counsel from others, they take it from their close friends because that's where they feel most comfortable. God, I'm asking you and I thank you for the young couples. I thank you for the young adults. I thank you for the teenagers. I thank you for the even preteens and the children that you've given to us in this church. I pray that you'd help the parents. I pray that you would help them. And God, to be able to stand and endure and to make it through this very volatile age period of their life. And Lord, help them to have a good footing in Christ and in the Word of God and faithfulness to the house of the Lord of where they're going to be able to stand every onslaught. So Lord, I pray that you'll give us all. But we as the senior saints of this church, let us be examples to those that are following in our footsteps. Of that Lord, that it is so critical to have a, a relationship with God that is so deep, that is so intimate, that nothing is going to be able to cause you to walk away from it. Lord, that your desire to serve God and, and to keep your life pure is going to be greater than the bad advice that you get from the wrong crowd. God, I know there's a host of emotions that's turned loose. I know they're grappling with those. I know there's indecision. I know that many times they do not have the maturity uh, to make the right decision. But God, help them, help them, help them. Help them to seek out the right advice. Help parents and grandparents and pastors and, 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 and the senior saints of the church to be in, in close friends with them as well. That they'll be able to recognize when something's off. And you need to go to them and ask, how can I pray? How can I help? What can I do? Father, we need each other in the body. 
need to be watching out for the welfare of each other in the body. So help us to do that. Lord, I'll give you the praise and I'll give you the glory for I ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.